So Barry, uh, you and I came to the Cornell Law School at the same time, and that was be the fall of 71. Um, you came having graduated from the Rochester Institute of Technology. When you graduated, did you plan on becoming a lawyer? Well, my, uh, my pathway here was a little, slightly more convoluted than that in that um, my last year at RIT was the year of um, demonstrations, moratoriums, um, mobilizations, March on Washington. And in that um, hullabaloo going on, which I was involved with, um, I, in terms of my future, I had thought I was going to go to graduate school in chemistry. Um, another thing we have in common. Uh, we were both chemists at one time in our lives. Um, and uh, so I applied to graduate schools in the midst of everything else that was going on at that point in that particular semester. Um, and I got accepted to MIT, among other places. And. Um, and I had this conversation with my father, who, um, who said, well, it's a good school. And then I, I had said something that I was thinking maybe I would go to law school, which was sort of an out, outgrowth of uh, protests and lawyers I had met during the course of being in, getting legal advice about what was a legal and what was an illegal demonstration, actually. Um, and um, so I ended up going to MIT. Um, I soon realized that I really didn't care, as I, as I, you might appreciate this, probably nobody else will. I realized I really didn't care anymore whether hydrogens were axial or equatorial. And um, uh, so I decided I would uh, go to law school. Um, I finished my semester at uh, MIT and um, I needed a job, so I went back to Eastman Kodak, which I had worked before as a co-op student. And then I applied to law school. I actually wasn't accepted to Cornell initially. I was, uh, I was uh, very close to going to Rutgers when I came off the waiting list here. Um, Al Nemeth um, has uh, always claimed that he jumped me on the waiting list because we had both gone to the same high school. Uh, Mepham in uh, on Long Island, but I don't, I don't think he was actually the admissions dean that year. But that's what he always told me, um, and uh, so that's how I ended up in law school in that sort of wandering way. Um, but I had a certain license, having quit um, graduate school um, for what I thought were good reasons. I had decided that I was pretty much. Uh, uh, going to do in my life what I wanted to do and what I felt was important to do rather than um, sort of being on some track. And I wasn't worried about failing at something because I decided to change direction. And did you bring that attitude to the law school curriculum and set of activities? I did in a in number of ways. Um, um, my uh, when I, when, I, when I came to the law school, I looked around what I wanted to do, and I immediately seized on the clinic. Um, just a little digression, which I didn't know this at the time, but uh, the clinic came into being here uh, in, um, in the 60s. Um, There's actually a court order that you can still uh, find uh, on West. Um, the order of the Appellate Division, Third Department, which a reported decision um, establishing the Corner Legal Aid Clinic. Um, and it was on a petition by Betty Freelander, who you may remember, uh, who was the first director of the clinic or attorney in charge, as the court order calls her. Um, I actually have seen and used to have, but I don't know where what happened to these documents, but the, they were a proposal by f three faculty members here to establish the clinic. Um, Norm Penny, uh, Faust Rossi, and um, somebody else. Now I knew Would who that was. Gray, Gray Thorne? No, it wasn't Gray Thorne, actually. It was Ernie Roberts. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then 
And you actually initially had to grade on to, as you had to grade on to law school and grade on to ILR, you had to grade into the clinic. And it wasn't credited, uh, it, was a, it was voluntary. Uh, so that all was in existence uh, before I came in 71. Um, my first year in, year in law school. So I, just to put right, a okay. point on it, put a point on it. Mm -hmm. the, the clinic that Betty Friedlander ran and that was in place when you came as a student was analogous to the law review and the, and the journal in that uh, it was a voluntary activity. It was not, not a for credit activity, Correct. but it was selective in the sense that you had to have an appropriate record to be admitted. Correct. Yeah. Um, it became credited maybe my first year at law school or maybe my first year in the clinic. I'm not quite sure. The law school um, hired Herb Warren, um, and he he was he was on the faculty during my first year in law school, um, and it may be at that point that the clinic became accredited course. Um, it certainly was the next year, which was my second year in law school, but it may very well have been. Uh, my first year in law school. The bulletin for that year did not suggest that. In other okay. Words, so I looked at the bulletin for 71, 72. Okay. Well, then it was the... It, it, then it didn't was show the, it to be a credit okay. course. Then it was the following year, yeah. um, since I was enrolled in the course right. the following year. Yeah. Um, and um, Herb Warren was a full-time faculty member, a tenure tract. Um, the son of um, Ernie Warren, Ernie Warren. Um, and he had, from my view, reflecting back, a, an essentially impossible job. I mean, he was teaching at least one, if not two, other courses. Well, he was teaching civil procedure against Rudy Schlesinger. I mean, sort of, right with Rudy as the standard, he had somehow to deal with. It. <laughs> right, and um, and he also taught a. Um, maybe a criminal procedure course, I seem to recall. And as, well, I, when I was a first year student, your second semester, you could take constitutional law or criminal procedure. And I opted for criminal procedure. Um, I don't recall why at this point, but, um, and Herb Warren taught it. And, um, and a lot of the third year students actually gave him a pretty tough time. Um, which for a first year student was uh, pretty remarkable to see. Mm -hmm. um, so then um, I joined the clinic. Um, I think the first semester I volunteered in the clinic that I, there was a limited number of spots and I didn't get in. Um, and um, so I got in my in the spring semester. Um, but I volunteered in the clinic. At that point, you could, you could, the grade requirement for the clinic had disappeared. And if you weren't in the course, you, can vo you could volunteer in the clinic and take on cases. And I took on a case or two. I don't really remember the number. One for certain, probably two. Uh, and then I enrolled in the clinic in my spring semester of whatever year that was. Must have been 73. Um, at that point, um, I think that was the point at which John Kapowski was hired. Um, I may be wrong. He may have come he after. Came, he came. Maybe well, he, must he was have, he hired may have in come. the fall of '73. Okay, so he he came my third year. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't know how many people Herb was supervising, but it certainly was too many for one person. Uh, Betty Friedner at that point had pretty much dropped out, although she did have a couple of criminal cases that she had students working on. Um, and what's important to realize at that point is that uh, the Cornell Legal Aid Clinic was essentially the only game in town for people who were indigent and needed legal help. Um, so there was a very high demand for representation um, and there was a fairly large number of students that 
uh, Herb Warren was trying to supervise. Um, there was a and there was a su substantial number of divorce cases. Um, um, that was the was the at, at, as it was operating then was the only contact point between the clinic and potential clients here at the law school or were there was there intake other okay. places? There were there was intake at the law school. There was also there was an organization called the Storefront which, if I remember right, was located on um, Main Street, um, probably in a, uh, I don't know, a storefront that's probably on what is now the Commons, which wasn't the Commons then, although it might have been further down State Street, um, run by a number of Nancy Beriano, Becky Fowler, um, who had ties to the university or to not-for-profits in, in, um, in Ithaca. Uh, and the clinic used to do intake there um, one night a week. Um, and then we'd do intake at the law school some other number of days a week. I, I don't really recall whether we did intake or, you know, five days a week or something less. Um, when I was a student. Um, the, um, so, um, so Herb Warren was there um, the, um, that year was, or at least my semester, I may have been the first clinic class from what you're suggesting mm -hmm. that, um, in the, no, the, the first clinic class was in the fall of 73, the second, mm -hmm. so I was, this was, this, no, no, let's see. Must have been the spring of 73 that I was in the clinic, and the first class must have been the fall of 72. You're suggesting otherwise, I think. Well, I don't know, yeah. but anyhow. Um, so that was the, the sort of the beginnings of the clinic as a credited course open to anybody in the law school. Um, and both on an enrollment basis and on a volunteer basis, with a um, with a substantial stream of cases available, um, did you have any contact with the Auburn Prison representation that, uh, course that was then being offered by Faust and, and Gray Thoron? Well, I did. You did. Um, in the summer of in the summer between my second, no, in the summer, yeah, but in the summer between my second and third years, I worked for the um, what was called the Auburn Prison Project. It had right, some right. Like, somewhat fancy right. name, I think, but um, because it was offering credit as a course, right, uh, at a time when the legal aid clinic was not. Initially, yes. Initially, right. Yeah. Uh, the time I was involved with it. It uh, well, I was involved with it as a summer job. Summer job. Um, and when that program ended, the few cases that were left got rolled into the clinic, mm -hmm. um, and um, and the clinic actually had the volunteer clinic um, actually had a criminal component. Um, they handled some criminal cases in some manner, which I never handled a criminal case, and I don't, I mean, the court order didn't authorize students, in, in fact, spe uh, specifically prohibited students from appearing on their own or mm -hmm. under supervision as the attorney in criminal cases. So the, there was some other arrangement, um, and um, I don't really know what that was since I, was, I never did any criminal mm -hmm. cases. Um, I had a brief contact on one criminal case with Betty Freelander at some point, but that was um, that was a week or so, and I don't even know what year that was. Um, so continuing forward, um, that's in the fall in the spring of '73. I was in the clinic as a as a course. Um, I don't really have a, a good attachment anymore to what the course content was. I mean, um, at that point in time, uh, people didn't have a, a real kind of defined sense of what to do in clinical courses. 
Um, that grew over the years that I was involved, but uh, it was pretty, I mean, there were some substantive courses. Uh, there were no um, classes, um, there were no, that I recall, any um, what I would call skills classes. Um, I may be vaguely correct about that. Maybe there was something, but I really don't recall at this point. There was discussion of some cases during class time. Um, and Herb Warren did not have a legal services or a, uh, a background. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually don't know what Herb's background was. Oddly enough, this is a total aside, but oddly enough, I had thought um, several years later that Herb had passed away. And about 10 years after that, something Ernie said to me. And maybe he had cancer and I misunderstood Ernie. And then one day, about 10 years later, uh, Herb Warren called me up. Um, and it was a very strange phone call since I had thought Herb had passed away 10 years earlier. And it took him a while to convince me that he was actually Herb Warren. Um, but getting back to, um, to 1973, um, the following year, Herb developed a second level clinical course um, uh, called, I think he called it Trial Council. Um, and at that point, um, John Kapowski came, um, since it was realized that uh, Herb just couldn't really handle the number of students he was trying to supervise. Um, I mean, essentially, in those days, um, at least at administrative hearings. And let's, let's just interject a, a brief bio of John. John was a 1971 graduate who had legal services. Background. John was a 1971 graduate who had a legal services background. Uh, he worked for what was then called Monroe County Legal Assistance Corp in Rochester uh, and had been representing people. Um, um, and he was hired to be, to work with Herb or um, as a staff attorney under Herb as director uh, in 73. Um, now, someplace in there, Herb was told that he was not going to get tenure and was it, so I don't know whether 70, this was, I didn't have privy, I'm um, mm -hmm. just a student mm -hmm. at this point, uh, so I don't know the details. You might recall the details, but I certainly don't recall the details. I never knew the details. Um, but someplace in there, it might have been during the 73, 74 year that Herb was told that he wasn't going to get tenure and that Herb may have left while the year I was gone, in other words, between, the, and the, I think Herb's last semester might have been the fall of 74, but I really don't know because that's the year that I was away. Yeah. So you graduated in 74. I graduated in 74. And then you, you went and you worked uh, in legal right. services. Yeah. Uh, Go, going back a little bit, um, the clinic in those days had offices. Um, I mean, um, uh, what am I looking for? Corporate offices, so to speak. Um, offices of the the um, the organization, um, and the students elected the offices. So there was this sort of odd. It was sort of a throwback to right. how the clinic had been created, not as a course, but as an yeah, organization. In the model of the journals, right? Right. Yeah, and. Um, so I, and, the, and then there were different divisions. There was a welfare division and a family division, and there was a president and a vice president and a consumer division and a criminal division. Um, and I had been elected, and each division had two offices. Um, and I had been elected as the um, uh, welfare division um, um, director. Um, uh, along with um, um, Dick Wesley, um, who, as you know, is nowadays a Second Circuit judge. Um, 
and had also been a New York Court of Appeals judge during his lifetime. Um, the interesting thing that happened in the fall of my third year, I think that's right, not more, the fall of my second year, was I suddenly graded on to law review. My grades were at a higher level. I mean, first I graded on to ILJ. I got a letter during the summer that my grades were such that I could be on ILJ if I wanted to, because now my grades were higher than the people who were on ILJ. And then I got a letter, same sort of letter, um, about law review. Um, and in fact, you may not recall this, but I do. Uh, you and I had a brief discussion uh, about whether I should uh, accept the offer to law review. Um, you may also recall I was your research assistant at some point to, during this period of time. Um, and I decided, I, I don't remember exactly what you advised me to do. You actually may have advised me to go ahead and, no, actually you didn't. You said that I really should decide what I thought was most important to me. And my experience of having left MIT served me well there, because that's when I decided that why I came to law school was to do what I was doing in the legal aid clinic and not really to do law review. And so I declined law review that year. Um, Richard Wesley actually um, was then graded on to law review his second semester of his second year. And then he left the clinic. Um, and um, John Tobin, who subsequently became the head of legal services in New Hampshire quite a few years later, not quite a few, a number of years later, became the other welfare division director. Um, but Dick Wesley um, then got involved in writing an article. There was a welfare law symposium that's, uh, that, uh, and, um, in the review. And, uh, right, and uh, in the law review, and Dick Wesley wrote one of the articles uh, uh, in that, uh, one of the articles that got published yeah. in that edition. Um, as I talk about these things, mm -hmm. things come back. Um, so that was, um, so you had this, this odd sort of arrangement, um, which continued for quite a few years, where you had this course, and then you sort of had this organization that was sort of... A student organization. A student organization that sort of coexisted yeah, with yeah, each other yeah, in, uh, yeah. in an odd sort of way. And it wasn't until quite a few years later that we actually discontinued having offices. Um, I mean, well into the 80s, mm -hmm. um, or maybe even later, maybe into the 90s. Um, so anyhow, um, one of the cases that I became involved in um, while I was a law student um, was a case that had to do with whether step parents could be held, whether their income could be considered in determining the welfare eligibility of their stepchildren. Um, and it was a federal regulation, which I can still recite, but I'll, I'll forego that, um, um, which said that uh, if there wasn't a law of general applicability in the state, uh, that uh, you couldn't impose that. Um, that obligation, couldn't consider the step parent's income. And it turned out that we had a case that was going to the Court of Appeals uh, at that point. Um, and there was a case in Nassau County on uh, Long Island on that case. And in the course of that, I became acquainted with Carl Nathanson, who was the litigation director in Nassau County. Um, the, the director of the program was a fellow by the name of Lynn Clark. Um, that became significant to me for two reasons. First of all, we, um, I mean, I didn't argue the case, but I was involved in writing the brief. Um, Herb um, ultimately argued the case, I think. Yeah, Herb, uh, maybe John argued it. I don't, can't remember who argued it. Um, um, 
but it also led to me getting a legal services job with uh, NASA Suffolk NASA. Law Services. Yeah. Uh, no, it was NASA's, NASA Law Services that hadn't spread mm -hmm. to Suffolk County. It subsequently spread to Suffolk County. Um, so I left the law school in 74. Um, the while I was gone, um, Herb, for first, for not, he didn't get tenure, and second, I think left in the fall of 74 while I was away. Um, and John was the only attorney left in the clinic um, that spring of 75. 75. At which point, uh, there was a search to find somebody. John was now directed to be staff attorney. Um, and I applied for that job and uh, ultimately mm -hmm. got the job. Um, so I had very little experience, actually, when I had the job. Mm -hmm. uh, as I've mm -hmm. often said to people that uh, in later years, we would have not even remotely considered me as a candidate for a job mm -hmm. in the clinic. Uh -huh. um, it was just er early in that process um, of people coming mm -hmm. to some understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, so that takes us up to the point um, of when I came back to the law school. Came back to the um, law school, and, and at that point there were two of you, right? John Kapowski and you. Um, both of you, you with relatively little, but John with somewhat more legal services experience. Right. Yes, uh, and um, commenced to take what had been previously, largely, a, a student voluntary activity and turning it into right. a structured legal education, clinical legal education set of courses. Right. Uh, yes. Um, although, I mean, that, that had started with her. Right. right. Um, um, the, um, there were a lot of issues. I mean, the Bar Association, to a significant degree, was not very happy with the clinic uh, in those days. Um, there was a feeling that uh, we were stealing business from them, um, particularly divorces. Um, uh, there was sort of a feeling that, um, that although we're talking about people who readily qualified for poor person status under New York law and really had virtually, you know, largely living on public assistance, that somehow before we existed, as, the, as people would say, well, somehow they were able to come up for that $500 for me. Um, we had a lot of people who had been separated for 10, 15 years who had never been divorced because they couldn't afford to pay an attorney to get a divorce. Um, and actually, I, I, I failed to mention this. Herb actually was involved in a significant case called Smiley, uh, in which the argument was made that there was a constitutional right uh, for counsel in divorce cases, and lost four three in the New York Court of Appeals. Um, it was there was a. It was a Supreme Court case, Krauss, I think, K-R-A-S, bankruptcy case that actually had held something like that. And that was partly what it was based on. Obviously, it was based on criminal cases. And there was a, a, a child neglect case that established a right to counsel in New York in child neglect cases. So, but anyhow, uh, but that was, that was her, I think that her created, I mean, came up with the idea to push that. And, uh, and, uh, um, and it was a significant case, but unfortunately it didn't succeed. Um, and there was just always this huge demand for divorce cases. I mean, we had a waiting list for divorce cases that would, you know, go on for years and we would call people who, you know, who had been on the list for years and years, and some of whom we could never find, you know, after a while. Um, in any case, um, John and I, had come from background where the legal services background where people handled very large caseloads. I mean, when I was an attorney at NASA, um, I did a lot of welfare cases, and I probably had open at any 
one time someplace in the 70 to 90 cases open. Um, absurd. Mm -hmm. um, when so when John and I uh, were in the clinic, we we took a fairly large number of students, much too many students, um, and we did not have a clear sort of sense of what the educational component of the clinic should look like, um, um, other than substantive law areas and uh, some some very rudimentary beginnings of some sort of skills training. Um, some place in there, um, I went to a clinical section meeting of the ALS um, in Cleveland, I remember it, it was in Cleveland. Um, and. Um, People had been moving along that line, and I was introduced to this notion of skills training and tying it into clinics. And um, I actually had a, a long discussion one night in a restaurant or a bar or something with Gary Bellows about this, uh, which had a significant effect on my thinking about it. Um, and. Would, would I be <laughs> fair in saying that Cornell was somewhat slow? Uh, in other words, that other schools had moved earlier to clinical legal education with some scale and therefore had more experience sort of working through the pedagogical issues than, than Cornell? Or is that... Uh, no, no I, uh, no, I think that's... I think that's true. Um, I think there was some... Um, um, I, I don't know that how, I think there was, there was a, many of the faculty had been soured by the Herb Warren experience. Um, I don't know that for an absolute fact, but um, I think when, when Herb was hired, there was, Herb was hired as a tenure track to be in the mm -hmm. clinic, when that didn't work out, um, there was some sense of that that was not a good direction to go. Um, um, I think Perb was an impossible situation. There's no way he could have um, achieved this, done what he was doing. I'm amazed that Perb managed to do what he did and with all the demands that were on him. Um, and, there, and there was some element of Herb that he was Ernie's son uh, and uh, that I thought played out in that. Uh, in any case, um, but you're correct. Uh, certainly there were schools, Georgetown, um, NYU, that embraced clinics in a much uh, more substantial way um, than, um, than Cornell, uh, uh, Yale. Um, Which is to say simply that these kind of national gatherings, uh, people engaged, were the discussion of pedagogy went on, as you said, Gary Bellow and, and others. Right. Um, that was a resource that enabled you and John then to start thinking about what we might do here. Right. And, and beyond clinics, I mean, the, the whole notion of skills training um, was a novel idea in the legal academy um, uh, also. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, just sort of. I mean, even trial advocacy courses at that point were in their infancy. I mean, NIDA came into being around that time, the National Institute of mm -hmm. Trial Advocacy. Um, um, so all this was sort of percolating, um, um, brought on by demands from the bar and from the political climate mm -hmm. and a whole host of things. Uh, um, so all, all that, as mm -hmm. I'm sure you remember, was all uh, moving around at the mm -hmm. time. Um, as a result of thinking about that, um, um, well, the other problem we had um, that I think that John and I were confronted with was 
there was a substantial student demand to be in the clinic, but there was also a substantial client demand to get help huge. in the clinic. Yeah. Oh, yes. Huge. Huge, right. huge client demand. Um, and, um, and just finding sort of cases um, that were good learning experiences for students, um, I mean, we immediately cut back on, the, I mean, we could have done nothing but divorces. The demand to do divorces was incredibly high. All right. Well, so in 1978, something else happened. Right. So 1978, Legal Services, um, federally funded Legal Services Corporation funding came to Tompkins County. Um, and uh, we, um, we were involved in, there was, Broome County Legal Services wanted Tompkins County, and Chemung County Legal Services wanted Tompkins County. Um, and um, I ultimately supported Chemung County, um, and they um, gave us a seat uh, on their board um, and uh, trade for that or as a consideration. Um, and we and one of the two initial attorneys um, well, Greg Thomas, who I think had graduated from Buffalo Law School, and Paul Bennett, who had been a student in the clinic my first year teaching. Um, so that opened as a two-attorney office, and that diminished to some degree. Um, uh, but the pressure to take well, it meant that cases. you were no longer the only game in town. Right. We were no longer the only game in town. Yeah. We, we, as a consequence, after that, we stopped taking new cases during the summer. Prior to that, we would take emergency cases during the summer. Mm -hmm. I actually have this vivid memory. This is an aside, but a vivid memory of a fellow pulling up into the law school parking a lot with a city of Ithaca bus in the middle of the summer, parking it and coming in into the in the clinic because his utilities were going to be turned off. And um, and then I remember riding on the bus with him, um, sitting next to the driver's seat. He was the bus driver, um, so he could explain to me what the problem was. Because uh, he couldn't stay in the clinic because he had to get back on get schedule. Get back on his route. <laughs> right. So I took a trip around Ithaca talking to this fellow. Luckily, the bus was, it was the summer. It was pretty much empty. It was the middle of the day. Um, and, um, and we ultimately got his utilities turned back on. But, um, but that was a type of emergency mm -hmm. type things we did during the summer as well as continuing on the cases that we had carried over right. from the school right. year. Um, and we continued to hire students during the summer for years after, um, but only to handle cases that, that you already we, had had. Kept, we already had. We didn't right. take new cases yeah. once yeah. legal services was in town. Um, the pressure was off also in the sense that at least we felt that people had at least maybe another alternative. Now, some of that started to shake out. Uh, the legal services office downtown didn't do divorces at all um, and didn't do custody cases at all. Um, uh, we pretty much at that point stopped doing landlord-tenant evictions, which were never, which were always, um, happened very fast and were very tense and were not very good educational cases for students because they just moved too fast. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we did all the housing type cases, but we stopped doing evictions and they did the evictions downtown. Um, we continued to do our own intake um, and, um, and it wasn't until several years later that we stopped doing intake and took just the re referrals, referrals from, 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 from downtown. That office also over time expanded from two attorneys to more attorneys. Mm -hmm. um, with numbers of our graduates um, over time, I mean, not all our graduates, but different people who mm -hmm. had been in the clinic. Um, um, I mean, 
today, Alicia Plotkin, who was, who was in the clinic here, is in that office and has been there for many years. Um, Diane Campbell, who was in the clinic, is in that office and has been there for many years. Um, Greg Thomas, who was one of the original people back in 78, is still the director and managing attorney of that office. Um, in any case, that, that allowed us to, um, to become more focused to create a better educational environment. And um, someplace in this period of time, we hired Bob Seibel. Exactly when? Um, I don't know. We, uh, clearly sometime in the 80s. Um, and we had also hired Kathy Sullivan. I don't know if Kathy Sullivan came now before Bob Seibel or after Bob Seibel. Um, I don't have to. I, 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 um, my guess is that Bob Seibel came before Kathy Sullivan. Um, at some point after Bob came, um, we let Dan Posner go, and, and then Kathy Sullivan replaced Dan Posner. Uh, we still had one position uh, for a good number of years, well into the 80s, that we were funding with attorney's fees. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we hired Bob to replace Dan, we um, Bob's position was, was hard money. And, mm -hmm. and Bob came as, uh, as co-director, if mm -hmm. I remember right. Mm -hmm. Um, Bob had had, um, had been at Maine and he had been at, um, IT I. Kent in, um, mm -hmm. Illinois, among other places. Yeah. Hard to keep track of. Don't ask me Bob's resume because that I can't do. Uh, John's a lot easier. Um, Bob moved around a lot, uh, over the years. Um, and so, but Bob brought more of a sense of, um, of that we should reduce the number of students we had and manage the caseload better, uh, which we did. Um, and, and we had already been doing that, uh, but Bob helped in terms of bringing, Bob was the, was the first experienced clinical teacher that we had hired from a different institution. So he had this experience He had this elsewhere. Right, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, uh, um, I mean, I and Betsy and Robin uh, and Dan had all had legal services backgrounds, but we hadn't had, before we came mm -hmm. here, had no teaching background. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was gone a year, so I had very little. Um, but before Bob came, Betsy, Robin, and I had developed a, a, I, I thought, a pretty sound curriculum that we developed on our own. Um, Bob helped us uh, a lot with, uh, um, with uh, thinking about the numbers of cases and the numbers of students that we were trying to supervise. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we had already started reducing that, uh, but Bob helped us consider reducing it more. Mm -hmm. One of the big problems we had in the clinic in those days was the student demand was was high and John and I had started a system where we would have students write letters and then we would pick from the students our concern was that we were looking for students who wanted to do legal service we wanted to make sure students who wanted to do legal services as, as a career would have this it would have opportunity. The, the opportunity that they didn't get lost mm -hmm. in a lottery or something. Mm -hmm. um, then there was some faculty um, unrest with that, um, and so then we went to a um, a hybrid system where we would reserve a certain number of spots uh, for a lottery, um, and for the letters, and then the rest we would select by lottery. And then eventually we were told we would have to accept everybody by lottery. And then it became this complicated system of preferences and et cetera, et cetera, which I couldn't possibly explain anymore. 
I'm not even sure I totally understood it then, but I definitely couldn't explain it anymore. So there was, so for a long period of time, um, there was just always this large student demand. Um, the clinic had two levels. Uh, it had an introductory level and what was called Legal Aid 2. Legal Aid 2 was a year-long course, at least initially back in, the Legal Aid 2 was essentially um, came from Herb Warren's trial advocacy, upper level clinic. So you would do Legal Aid 1 in your second year, one of the two semesters? Or you could do it in your third year. Or you could do it in, in your, your third, third year, year if you hadn't done Legal Aid previously. And Legal Aid 2 was a third year course. I mean, you had to have done Legal Aid 1. Right. So by definition, two. it was third year yeah. course. Yeah. Uh, and it was only people who had completed Legal Aid 1. Right. Um, so all those people are obviously people that take Legal Aid 1 in their second year. Yeah. Oh, um, and it was a relatively, I mean, the numbers were, uh, and the Legal Aid 2 students were engaged in helping to supervise the Legal Aid 1 students. A model that we kept, or at least I kept, um, until I retired. Um, I mean, the time I retired, there were different clinical courses, and some people had that model and some people didn't, mm -hmm. but in the courses that I taught, I kept that model throughout. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think it was of significant benefit to, well, I think it was benefit to both of the upper level and the yeah, lower uh, level. Yeah. Um, so, um, So trying to speed up a little mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, so Bob uh, was there. Um, Dan Posner had left. Um, um, maybe Dan, maybe Betsy Fuller left first. Because Be Betsy, uh, Betsy Fuller, if it, uh, had a child, came back, and then wanted to, and then decided that. She, she and her husband wanted to try uh, to uh, develop a nursery, not for children, but mm -hmm. for flowers. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so Betsy then left. I think Betsy actually left before Dan and Bob may have replaced Betsy. I can't remember the, mm -hmm. the exact ordering of this. And someplace in there, Kathy Sullivan came, um, who um, had been a legal services attorney in Oneonta. Um, and she, uh, she must have been in the clinic for here for about 10 years, ultimately left to go to Yale. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in her, I mean, she and Betsy Fuller and Dan Posner have all passed away over the years, which mm -hmm. is, given that they were all younger than I was, that's fairly remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow. Um, At some point, you were going to ask a question. Well, I was going to say, Go ahead. Um, so we, we have this uh, evolving clinic. Right. Um, you continued to be director of the clinic until 70, from 78 to 89. Right. I, right. You, yeah. you left the deanship in 88. 88. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think I, it was either 88 or 89. I should mention one other thing in there. Yeah. Uh, this is, there was a... Um, there was a point um, during this period in the 80s, I'm pretty sure, well, I know it was in the 80s because it, it involved Betsy, um, or maybe it didn't involve, well, that the law school created um, a, a lawyering skills requirement. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to create freestanding lawyering skills courses since the only course we had that pre-existing that fit that bill was trial advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe there was some other course. Maybe there was something that Bruno helped, helped whatever, a uh, family law clinic that somebody did, um, or a family law practicum. I don't remember. Anyhow, so we then created a, Betsy and I did an interviewing and counseling and negotiate, or interviewing counseling course and somebody did a negotiation course, but we started to create some freestanding lawyering skills courses. 
I that did not involve live clients. Did not involve live clients. Yeah. Um, I actually think Betsy may have come back to teach th those courses with me as an adjunct, rather what, than while she was still in the clinic. Um, but I can't be sure. Um, that requirement eventually disappeared, and to a large degree, those courses then disappeared. Um, in 1988, I stepped down as director, and Glenn Galbraith became director. Um, and Glenn was director for a period of time. Um, you probably could ask Glenn. He probably. Mm -hmm. I subsequently became director again. And in 2000. Um, okay. You, you have these dates better yeah. than I have yeah. these dates right now. Um, so there was a period of time that, that Glenn was director. I don't think anybody else ever became. Well, no, Joanne was director Joanne for was. Joanne was a director for a period of time also. Um, and we went through, I mean, someplace along the line, John Bloom came and there was a, the death penalty clinic. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were, there were other clinics that, and um, that sort of specialty, cropped up specialty, specialty clinics. clinics yeah. And um, we started to do some specialty clinics. Um, I did for a number of years a governmental benefits clinic. Uh, Bob and um, Joanne did a family law clinic. Um, some place along the line, we hired Nancy Cook, and she did a youth law clinic. Mm -hmm. um, so we had this odd mix of things. We had mm -hmm. clinics that were floating around that were sort of independent of the corner legal aid clinic, mm -hmm. but then in the corner under the rubric of the corner legal aid clinic, we had uh, at various times specialty clinics, and then we also had sort of plain vanilla legal aid one and legal aid two. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a pretty well established then and a well thought out skills component. Um, and when we had the specialty clinics, uh, at least at the ones that were associated with the people teaching legal aid clinic, we used that classroom component for um, a large part of the classes that all the clinics used. Uh, with a, an occasional, well, actually, in the governmental benefits clinic, I had a separate classroom component with a with an additional amount of credit for which was basically a no. welfare law course, a substantive, a substantive sure. welfare law course. Um, so there was a great deal of sort of variety mm -hmm. um, as time went on, both within the, the room, the corner, uh, within the legal aid clinic and outside the legal aid clinic. Um, and um, So as this, that's right. this variety expanded, um, then you came back as director of the Rubric legal, legal aid clinic. clinic right. In, or a co-director with Glenn. Yeah, or, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, essentially what had happened is that the Nobody in the clinic wanted to be director. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we needed to come up with a solution to this problem. Um, uh, in other words, when Joanne decided that she didn't want to be director any longer, I don't remember when that was, you might know, um, nobody wanted to be director. Um, I had been director at that point, you know, I had been director for 10, 11, 11 years. years. Yeah. Um, Glenn had been director for five or six years. Joanne had been director for four or five years. And nobody wanted the job. But Joanne definitely didn't want it. She, uh, <coughs> um, so the first thing that happened was Glenn and I formed an agreement that he, I would be director for um, three semesters, and he would be director for three semesters. Subsequent to that, we, um, we agreed we'd be co-directors for whatever period of time. Um, so that's, um, 
And until the, the big change, which was when all the clinics were brought together under um, one skills, whatever John's title is, director, dean, uh, I don't know what John's title is, but um, that brought all the clinics director, which was essentially the year, well, it was the year before the year that I, um, I retired. Um, and Joanne had retired a year before that, um, that, uh, that all the clinics were, were brought together. Um, Kathy Sullivan had come and gone uh, during that period. There were other people. I, I visited at Syracuse Law School, um, which is worth mentioning for, for this one reason. Um, the year I visited at Syracuse Law School, um, um, there was a, a New York State Welfare uh, Lawyers, Legal Services Lawyers Task Force meeting in Syracuse. Um, I mean, they had these meetings fairly regularly. I had never gone before, uh, but I was in Syracuse and um, I was, for the day I was teaching there. Uh, so I went to the meeting and there were 25 attorneys in the room and 12 of them were former students. And the 13th was Brian Hetherington, who was not a former student because he was a student in my gap year, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He graduated the year, he graduated in 75, mm -hmm. uh, the year that I was away. But I knew him as a, a student because he became the welfare division director uh, after I left that position uh, when I graduated. Um, so that was uh, sort of um, showed that I had some and, and some sort of impact. And the affirmation, right? Right. right. Um, and, and you also, as an individual, had impact through um, your publication. That is to say, you you revised uh, uh, a handbook on or a guide on public benefits in New York. Right. And also Medicare, uh, New York Medicare eligibility. Medicaid. Medicaid yes. eligibility. Um, I had, when we were doing welfare cases, um, well, even going f further back, when I was a law student, I took a welfare course from uh, Peter Martin. Um, also took a HUD course from Peter Martin. Um, and, um, and when I became welfare division director when I was a law student, um, I had some sense of federal welfare law uh, from having taken mm -hmm. your course. Um, and, uh, but I then went, proceeded to teach myself New York State um, uh, welfare law um, by basically sitting down and reading the New York State statute and the New York State regulations um, and looking at the federal stuff and seeing what was consistent and what was inconsistent, which was, at that point, a way of successfully literally litigating mm -hmm. welfare cases. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, by the time I was in my third year, I knew more New York welfare law than Herb Warren did, because Herb Warren really didn't know any New York welfare law. I mean. Herb would call me and ask me questions. Uh, I mean, I, it's not a criticism of Herb, it's just that it was a fairly you know, narrow field of law which was very complicated. And uh, I had taught myself this. Uh, um, when I came into the clinic, when I came back to teach, it became very clear to me that the students, you know, it was difficult to prepare students to go to hearings when they had no background in welfare law. So, uh, and John realized this too. So we started to write a, um, a legal aid handbook, which had a welfare law section and a consumer section and a landlord tenant section. That welfare section started to grow over time. Um, and so for something that started um, originally as, you know, 30 or 40 pages became several hundred pages, and by the time I was done became 1,500 pages. 
um, and was distributed far right. beyond we, Cornell Law School. Well, what then happened was people started to ask me for it. I mean, graduates um, mm -hmm. who knew this material existed. Uh, and the Greater Upstate Law Project in uh, Rochester, um, who I, I knew the people there, um, said, you know, that there was this demand, could I distribute it to them? Um, and um, so I initially would, you know, run off um, several, you know, a hundred for them. They would go to them and then they would distribute them. Then I started to get requests from outside people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it, it and so in a significant way, it put the Cornell Legal, Legal Aid Clinic at least on the map in New York. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And students would come back to me and say, do you know you're famous? And I would say, well, no. And I mean, these were people who went right. to go interview in uh, uh, legal search. And of course, the, the um, people in, in practice in legal search believed that students wrote the legal aid manual, but mm -hmm. They didn't, because it would have been impossible for right. There were students who actually edited. I mean, I would write it, and then they would proof it. Mm -hmm. um, and they would tell me what they didn't understand so I could rewrite it. Right. Um, but I did all the writing. Um, and that went on for a good number of years. Um, then at some point, um, people started to approach me and ask me if they could have the Medicaid section. Um, these were people who were not um, not legal services not legal people, services. and to a large degree weren't even attorneys, mm -hmm. but were social workers or administrators in nursing homes and Involved hospitals. With and health care right, delivery. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, so I then cut out um, the Medicaid section added pieces from the public assistance section and the SSI section, which, as you know, are, mm -hmm. are become standards in Medicaid mm -hmm. and the very convoluted Medicaid program that still exists, hopefully, for mm -hmm. some time longer. Um, and, um, and started to, and then, of course, with your help, we started publishing it on CD, mm -hmm. uh, CD-ROM, I guess it was called then. Mm -hmm. Still may be called that. I don't know what it's called nowadays. Uh, you probably know better than I do. Um, but, um, and um, whatever that program was that made it searchable. Folio Views. Folio, Folio Views, right. Which I still have a copy of the program someplace. Um, I don't, I actually don't think it, it's probably on, it's probably, probably on a, probably on a disc that your computer, computer won't, won't read. Tell you, won't read anymore, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so that was, um, so that yeah. brings us more or less up to date. All right. um, I'm sure I've missed something yeah. in this long history, but um, so that um, so that by the time you retired, um, the, all of the specialized clinics have been brought under the supervision of John Bloom. Right. And um, and when I retired, and and when you retired, did you leave all of this behind? In other words, did you have have you worked on that that guide to public benefits at all since you retired? Well, the guide to public benefits. You stayed on the board of of what was Shimon County Legal Services, now Western New York. Right. right. Well, yeah. moving back on that, the first of all, with regard to the books, the the welfare reform in 1996 essentially did me in. Mm -hmm. um, um, My children um, demanded that um, I could no longer spend the entire summer writing this book. Um, and to, and I, and, and, to, and, to, and to deal with writing the book after welfare reform, 
which would require massive revisions. Um, I, I realized that I couldn't meet their needs, and sure. so essentially the book died then. I, I may have published a couple of more Medicaid editions after mm -hmm. that, since mm -hmm. Medicaid was not substantially impacted by welfare reform. Mm -hmm. um, but, but essentially at that point, I uh, stopped writing the book, um, or at least a large mm -hmm. book. Um, and then the Medicaid part, Peter, I mean, there was enough dependency between public assistance and Medicaid that at some point, uh, oddly enough, <laughs> I don't know, oh, I put in the corner legal aid clinic into, um, into um, Google yesterday because I was looking for the, see the date of this order, which I knew existed, and up came my book. The Corner Legal Aid Welfare Man uh, Manual came up on Amazon, which sort of shocked me. Um, it said it was out of print, but um, uh, it just sort of shocked me that it would t still turn up on an internet search. Not even as public benefits in New York, but as the Corner Legal Aid Welfare Manual. Well, public benefits in New York turned up on a Google search, too, uh, in South Africa. Oh, really? Available in South Africa. <laughs> oh, wow. I guess I should go look at that. Um, so, yeah. So the the answer to your to your other question is no. When I retired, I actually retired. Um, the only law related thing that I have done since I've I mean I have even let my bar registration lapse. Um, although I still think I can do pro bono cases. The rule was oddly worded, so long as I don't get paid. But, um, but I'm not even sure of that. Um, um, the only law-related thing I took a course with um, Muna mm -hmm. and um, somebody else who will come. Well, the name is escaping me. The woman who's uh, um, who does family law. Um, Having trouble with names sometimes, okay. I've noticed that I... Uh, Cynthia Bowman. Cynthia Bowman, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, on um, law in, um, in, South, in South, South and, and, and Africa, um, customary, and, customary law, law and basically civil rights or... Um, and then we went um, to South Africa. Um, in, during intercession, and um, Ellen went with us, and mm -hmm. um, so, but that was a very so I, that was one of the core. What I have been doing since I retired is I've been taking courses and traveling. So I've taken pretty much uh, two courses a semester uh, since I've retired, and host of things that interest me: Lovely. astronomy, uh, religion, whatever. So, uh, and. Uh, and I might, if I can ever find a time that fits my schedule, I might take Islamic law, but um, that's the, uh, so, in All any right. case. Well, thank you very much for You're welcome. sharing these recollections and reflections. Thank you.